Hey, fools. Welcome to Motley Fool Live. I'm uh, Tim Byer, senior advisor, uh, or lead advisor, I should say, for Rule Breakers and Interconnected Opportunities. I'm here with Bill Magnuson, the CEO and co-founder of Braze. Bill, uh, good morning. Thanks for, for coming on to, to talk about Braze. You just had quarterly results, good results, revenue up 33% uh, year over year, uh, good growth uh, across the board here. But we'll get to those earnings numbers in a minute. I want to talk a little bit about this company that, that you've built. That's, so let's go back into the, into the Wayback Machine a little bit and describe what Braze is, but starting from what you saw when you and Jonathan Hyman founded this company, and I, I think I have it right. Is it, is it 2011 when you founded this company? And what was, yep. what was the problem that you saw at that time that informs the company that, that we see today? Yeah, so I'll actually take a, a step back a little bit. Uh, so I uh, studied computer science at MIT, and I was graduating around 2009. And in uh, in late 2008 was when Android was about to launch. And yep. I actually had the good fortune to be able to take a building mobile applications course uh, my senior year there. And we actually had Rich Miner, who was the founder of Android. He would come into our lectures every Friday and he would bring his dog in, uh, which was pretty awesome. And we were building on uh, pre-release G1 hardware that, if you remember that old uh, slider phone with the QWERTY oh, keyboard and the... Yeah. And the, the <laughs> the rollerball and everything uh, that uh, we we started building mobile applications on top of that. And of course, pre-release software also means there was almost no documentation. So I, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> right. it, was a, it was a bit of a struggle. Uh, but, you know, that gave me an early lens into mobile and, and a really early experience with it. I still remember the first day that I was actually in the middle of a phone call on my BlackBerry Pearl and the battery died on it. And I actually, I was like, oh, I, I bet you that I can use this dev device that I've been given for this class to be able to finish my phone call. So I moved the SIM card over and of course it worked. Uh, and, and I've been an Android user ever since actually. Wow. And uh, so went from that, you know, graduated and then uh, moved out to San Francisco and worked at Google in Mountain View. And I was working in a, on a Google research project around Android, uh, which is called App Inventor for Android, which actually still exists today. Uh, it's a visual programming language for building mobile applications. And it, I was on a team with a number of professors and, and their former PhD students that they had collected around Google. Uh, and we worked with a bunch of institutions to be able to help uh, these introductory computer science classes uh, build mobile applications as part of their curriculum. And so I was working on that project, had early exposure to it. And then I um, finished my master's and graduated and, and went back into the finance industry, actually. I had worked at Bridgewater Associates, a hedge fund oh. up in Connecticut. Uh, okay. in 2008, which is obviously an auspicious time to be at a global macro hedge fund. Yes. And, and, uh, and, you know, had gone back, I had some student loans to pay off and everything else and, uh, and spent about 18 months there. But while I was there, mobile kind of kept like haunting me and, and luring me back, you know, and I felt like, well, the finance industry was an interesting place to be, that there was a massive transformational change underfoot and that I really wanted to be a part of it. And so mm. um, John Hyman actually, uh, who is the Braze CTO today, um, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but actually when we first started, I was the CTO, John was our CIO, and we had a third co-founder named Mark Amazing who was the CEO. And the three of us together, you know, I think what we saw was that there was tremendous potential in mobile, but that wasn't being realized to really build businesses. And so there were mm. two parts of it. There first was this, this conviction that huge businesses would be born and built to be mobile first. And of course, that mm -hmm. seems laughably obvious now. But in 2011, you know, most of the popular apps in the App Store were things like prank calling soundboards and, yeah. you know, compass and flashlight apps because nothing had been built into the operating system yet. Right. Um, you know, toys, gimmicks, little utilities, etc. Uh, and those mobile applications also didn't have business models. In fact, ironically, the fact that you would buy an app for 99 cents or $1.99 in the early days actually was working against us. You know, we were trying to build a toolkit to help mobile app developers be able to engage their audiences over the long term, you know, help kind of cement habits and relationships, understand how people were using their mobile apps so that they could drive additional engagement and help avoid churn. And I used to pitch it at mobile app meetups in. New York and San Francisco back in 2011-2012 with the tagline of, you know, help turn your app into a business. And I remember mm -hmm. someone coming up to me at one of those meetups and them saying, 
hey, I want people to stop using my app as soon as possible because after they pay me the $1.99, that's all the money I'm ever going to make from them. And the sooner they stop using the app, the sooner I can stop paying the server bills. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, so this was right. kind of the, the feedback environment that we launched into in 2011. But, you know, we just had that conviction that mobile was going to become more and more a part of people's lives and that you'd be able to build, you know, real sustainable businesses on top of that by providing, you know, digital services and, and products and such. And then the, the second part of it, which came you know, which came into fruition later, but was always part of the plan as well, was, of course, that the wide scale adoption of mobile by consumers would transform existing businesses. And so you actually still see that, you know, to fast forward all the way to today, that early provenance still exists in our customer base where um, our revenue roughly breaks down 50-50 between commercial, what we call commercial and enterprise, where, you know, there's small young businesses that are trying to quickly acquire a new customer base. They want to be able to retain those users as they spend dearly to acquire them. They want to be able to understand how their customers are using their product, especially as it's evolving quickly in the early days or as their user base is expanding into new countries and regions or new socioeconomic groups or what have you. And the personas that are using their product are changing over time to be able to really stay ahead of that so that their acquisition and their retention strategies can keep pace. And then of course, we've seen mobile really show up and disrupt every existing vertical and in industry. Um, and about 50% of our business comes from the enterprise. We're highly diversified across verticals. You know, we, we really tried to work on a problem that I think is core to capitalism, which is just, if you wanna build a sustainable business, you know, how do you keep connections with your customers over the long term? How do you engender, you know, the advocacy and loyalty and really um, having people make your product and service a part of their their day to day lives or, or a part of their uh, routines so that they can have long term loyalty. And so, you know, over the last I guess, what, almost 13 years now, uh, we've been building toward really servicing those two major categories of these like born and built to be mobile first, and then the enterprises that are being transformed and disrupted by changing consumer behaviors around mobile. It, I mean, it's really interesting. And I want to describe how how Braze works here. So if I can give you, I, I it, it seems like the core innovation was just to build off what you you just said there about building customer relationships. One of the key innovations with Brace, if I understand it correctly, and I want you to correct me if I don't, was this idea that if you are going to engage with customers, particularly in mobile first, you have a lot of channels you could build around, and most of the existing technology was built around the channel. I have an email marketing thing, and I have a messaging thing. And what Braze was built around, again, if I understand it correctly, it was the idea of you got a customer, let's let the customer choose what channel they want to use and we'll build you a platform that allows you to engage with the customer and then you can kind of fine tune it. And then however they want to engage with you, then you can set it up to engage. That is that the, Was that the idea that like this is broken and we're going to build it around the customer instead of around the channel? I am so so that's that's exactly right. It's a characterization, um, except you need to sprinkle a little bit of uh, I'll just say ignorance um, on our part because we didn't we didn't actually know what the marketing landscape looked like at the time because we weren't marketers, and so yeah. we were actually just solving it more from first principles and. Um, and the and the problem that you describe with how the existing landscape worked is really this classic, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail problem, Sure. Uh, which is that, you know, when a marketer sits down, if they've got an email marketing solution, they're not asking themselves, like, how am I engaging with the customer journey holistically? You know, how do I match together what, how the customer wants to interact with me and what my business's goals are and find like a harmonious way to be able to connect those two? They're just saying, what email am I going to send today? Right. Yeah. And that leads you to, you know, the wrong, <laughs> it leads you to the wrong solutions, to these problems. When we started, we actually, as I said, we didn't have marketing backgrounds. And, and if you go back to that anecdote I have from the meetup, it's clear that mobile apps actually didn't have marketing teams in the early days because they didn't right. have business models and you don't spend money to amplify a business model when you don't have one. Um, but the uh, over time, of course, this problem of maintaining, you know, strong connections with your customers, doing it through communication and through, um, you know, understanding the data that drives that drives the customer behaviors that ended up becoming owned primarily by marketing teams or by uh, growth teams, which are these interdisciplinary teams that bring together marketing, engineering, and data science usually. And 
that evolution over time and kind of this move from the activity of sending messages in silos to, you know, what we refer to as the craft of customer engagement, where you're really connected to what the customer wants, how they're trying to interact with your product and service, you know, the, the kind of the arrogance of even calling the prior generation of tools, these like these journey building tools, as if the email marketing was in charge of the customer journey, right? Um, <laughs> it kind of made sense 10, 15, 20 years ago, where most of your email was being read when you're sitting down probably sitting down at your desk at work, which is where most people had computers, right? When when Exact Target and Responsus and Neolane, which are the email service providers that make up the marketing clouds of, of Salesforce, Oracle, and Adobe today, they were literally founded in 1999, 2000, 2001. It was a very different world, very different technology environment. You know, most people didn't even have computers at home yet. And they would read their email in a relatively uncluttered inbox. They were probably at work. They were actually focused on it. You know, compare that to our digital journeys today, where it's completely nonlinear, it's moving from channel to channel and platform to platform, you know, very fluidly, you will show up to interact with a brand at any moment of the day, you do it on your terms, whenever you want to. And that is a tremendous opportunity for brands to be able to both understand the customer much more holistically, as well as to be able to communicate with them. But it also creates this strong responsibility that you're beaming yourself directly into someone's, you know, personal device at what could be some of the most like important moments in their lives. And so that is, is a, you know, I think a tremendous responsibility, but also there's a lot more noise in there too, right? And there's a lot more uh, competition for their attention and their focus. And so you need to be compelling and relevant and engaging as well. And so those, you know, that kind of tension between that huge opportunity, but of course, the, the high bar, both from a responsibility and from a performance perspective, you know, from our standpoint also meant that we just needed to take a much more sophisticated approach to this problem than had existed before. And so Braze is actually architected much more like a hyperconcy trading system than it is like a marketing technology. In the oh, sense that if, if we think about the problem of a high frequency trading system, effectively what you're trying to do is, you know, you've got new data points that are constantly spilling in, whether it's like every single tick of the, uh, you know, of, of the stock ticker throughout the day, uh, maybe it's the new jobs report as it flows in, you know, new macroeconomic indicators, et cetera. Those new data points come in. And then what you're going to try to do as quickly as possible is, you know, take the new data point to update your current view of the world, right? The model that, that you're holding for a particular equity or a particular market or what have you. And then you're going to take your trading strategy and apply that to the model. That's going to then output an action that, or, you know, one or more actions that you want to take. It might be a buy or a sell or, a, you know, it might feed into some other model to then be, need to resolve that itself. And then you want to execute that trade as quickly as possible. And then there's kind of two feedback loops that happen. One of them is the synchronous feedback loop of, of actually watching whether the market moves and the trade is still available and maybe you'll make the next, right? And then there's the asynchronous one where the reporting goes out and you analyze that over time in order to then simulate new strategies and you kind of feed those back in. And the same analog exists in customer engagement. So a customer is using your product or service, right? When Braze deploys in our customers, we integrate directly into their mobile apps or into their websites. And so someone or their connected fitness products or connected TVs or what have you, right? We work across all these different channels, but basically anywhere the consumer is interacting uh, digitally. And so they take an action in the mobile app. That new data point flows into the top of our system. We then update their user model uh, where we combine that new action and the evolving context around them along with our existing view of them. We then take all the engagement strategies that our customers have programmed into Braze and we apply them to the new state of that model. And that might output different actions that we need to take, including sending a message, canceling a scheduled message, moving someone to um, the next step in one, of their, in one of their canvases or what have you. And then there's the synchronous part, which is that customers, of course, are on a nonlinear journey and they're moving from channel to channel and platform to platform. And so we want to see how they engage with that message because, you know, doing so might bring them, they might click on an email and go into a mobile app, or they might be going from the web into the mobile, or, or they might have now shown up in their SMS inbox, or maybe they're chatting with me on WhatsApp or what have you, right? That ability to coherently move from place to place and be able to flow synchronously with the full knowledge of everything going on is a really important part of that. And then, of course, asynchronously, we want to be able to get people real-time reporting so they can evolve their strategies and, and 
you know, update them and test and experiment. And that's also an important place where our machine learning is able to then, you know, churn through those results and be able to come up with more predictive matching and, and other sorts of optimizations. And all of that lives in an event-driven stream processor, uh, where every single data point that flows in is considered one at a time. They're all executed on in real time. And I think that that's both a technology shift, of course, because, you know, obviously the systems that were built back around 2000 were not built on top of event-driven stream processing. And indeed, the vast majority of the marketing technology landscape, even today, is still being built on top of batch processing and relational databases and what have you. Um, but it's also a reflection of the reality that we live in in mobile, which is that if you're going to respond to the customer who's moving through the journey on their terms in a nonlinear fashion, showing up at any moment of the day and wanting to be able to be interactively communicated with in a way that's relevant and personalized, you need to show up with really advanced technology in order to meet that challenge. And so that, that event driven stream processor that lives in the flow of the data and actually understands the context of it as it evolves in real time, you know, that's the kind of purpose built technology to be able to solve that problem. And that's where Brace started all the way back in 2011. And we've of course been, uh, been scaling that all the way to today. Yeah, and and the growth has been amazing. But before I I hit you with with some numbers here because there there there's been a lot of growth in in the business. I want to make sure to I, I pause and and translate a bit for for those who are are non technical users here. So what I heard from you, and I think you just explained pretty elegantly actually why when I go to the grocery store every time I go to the grocery store and I come back, the first thing I see on my phone is what. It's a new app or it's a new pop up on my phone from Ibotta. And Ibotta, I think, I, I wonder if they're still a customer. I remember when they I are. first researched, yeah. they are. Uh, that's not surprising at all, Bill, because like I get, and they're, they're generally incredibly relevant. Like now they're trying to get me something that I may not want to buy, but it's, it's adjacent, probably adjacent to something I have bought or I may have looked at. Which is very interesting. And so what I heard, if I want to translate this down, is that you call this a high, you know, akin to a high frequency trading system. So Braze is looking at a ton of data points doing event stream processing. In other words, stream processing is real time. I'm not just taking data, archiving it into the system in the back, the, the right. database, and then I'm going to look at it later. It's the right. data is coming in, it's streamed, and I can take actions on it immediately that's the difference here so when you talk about on earnings calls i want to make sure i'm hearing you correctly you say we have an opportunity to you know do these legacy migrations legacy upgrades that's what you're talking yep. about taking somebody that's had an archival system and saying look at how you can benefit from a real-time system like brave yep. am i describing that correctly yeah, and you know that's a massive part of it, and the, and the key in understanding that I think is just in in really um, grokking event driven, right? Which is that okay. instead of an event flowing in, and as you said, the first thing you do is you go write it down, and then you have a separate system that goes and looks at it, right? That's that's batch processing in the sense that you're you have separated processes that are storing into the database, and then yep. there's another system that's looking at it in the database, and you can make those batches smaller and smaller, right? You can look at it on instead of once an hour or once every 15 minutes, you could even be looking at it every minute, right? But there's a difference between that kind of two-stage process of write it down and then have a system of processes versus event-driven, which is, hey, a new data point just showed up. Now I'm going to execute on it, right? Right. And, and it. that's the difference between kind of living in the flow of the data versus having, you know, having those stages be separated. And it's obviously, you know, if you kind of think about that, it's certainly more expensive and harder to scale kind of living in the flow of the data, um, particularly when as a as a marketing tool as well, you know, we do a lot of stuff that is operational, that's interactive with the user. Um, but we also, you know, if you look at media and entertainment, breaking news use cases, you know, if we in the sports industry, you know, big, uh, big events and major sports games, etc. Um, there's also or even just like, you know, your weekly promotional messages that are going to go out or maybe with, um, with delivery, you know, trying to get ahead of people's lunch hour in a particular country or region or what have you. Um, there's all these reasons that people would send even with a, you know, event driven real time system would still send bulk messages all at once. And if you think about the engineering challenge of that, when you also are doing in product messaging, 
you know, we get this request to send out a massive number of messages to everyone in a customer base, which we do as fast as we possibly can. And Braze is a very high scale, highly parallel system that does that quite, quite quickly. And then as people receive those messages, they're all opening the application at the same time as well. And so that's a massive spike in load. And then as they come into the application, we also render content inside the product. And so we can do surveys, we do interstitials in product. We also have um, a persistent message feed called content cards, which can be incorporated into an inbox or into carousels or other parts of the product experience. And so all of that also gets personalized as the user is opening the product. And so, you know, really living in the flow of the user behavior uh, in, you know, in ways where you can have unpredictable scale, pretty hard technical challenge. And we actually just last week released some uh, new numbers from our calendar year 2023 to uh, put some scale around that. Uh, we processed a 7.5 trillion incoming API calls last year. I was going to ask you uh, about this. Our... Yeah. What is what is happening when you have 7.5 API, a trillion API calls and then you had something like 2.5 trillion what yeah there were there were some ridiculous numbers in here 2.6 trillion outgoing actions 7.5 trillion API calls. What is happening yeah. there, Bill? Well, the 2.6 trillion outgoing actions are, you know, the vast majority of those are literally messages being sent to customers across all these channels that we've mentioned, you know, whether it's mobile push notifications, web push notifications, email, SMS, WhatsApp messages, or in product, we might be delivering surveys, rendering interstitials, being, um, you know, providing like little dismissible slide ups or, or rendering content cards. And so messaging across a lot of different places. Um, and then when we talk about, actions. Uh, those can be other generic things. And they're usually either uh, web service calls through something called a webhook, which allows you to kind of generically orchestrate a lot of different things. It might be something internal to your own system. So maybe you want to um, generate a voucher code for someone. Maybe you have your own internal inbox system that you've built for a secure message center, um, like at a bank or in the healthcare industry. Uh, maybe you're, you, people even use it to, uh, to kind of process returns or to ship things to people as long as there's an API. Uh, on top of those shipping systems or to coordinate with other sorts of um, POS systems to be able to bring data back to the actual salesperson working in a store. Um, so a lot of flexibility there, um, as well as uh, data manipulation jobs that might be transforming data. You know, a lot of times when a user takes an action, it actually, if you consider the simple example of a dating application, you might actually want to update information in someone else's profile, not even necessarily just in your own, right? So that ability to then trigger an action elsewhere in the graph of users, uh, or uh, there's actually also places where people will reach into the paid ad ecosystem as well. You know, there's been a lot going on with the death of the cookie and the IDFA changes from Apple's app track. Uh, app tracking transparency framework uh, yep. and that ability to actually say, oh, hey, I just saw this person show up in my mobile app. Like, let's stop running ads against them as soon as possible so we can stop wasting money on them. Like, we've re engaged them. Uh, there are some really high ROI use cases in that as well, where you take these first party experiences and you use them to help orchestrate some of your ad buying. And so, so that 2.6 trillion number <laughs> is the combination of all of those things. And mm. then the seven and a half trillion. Uh, is, you know, all of the times that we've got data flowing into the system. So I mentioned that we're integrated into our customers' apps and websites and connected fitness products and what have you. So every time a user is taking an action, opening one of those, you know, clicking on this button, using this feature, um, all, of, all of those things, you know, those are going to trigger incoming messages uh, or incoming API calls to Braze, uh, which we will then immediately take action on with our event-driven stream processor. So is it fair to describe Braze then? And then I, I want to I want to pivot to to the the just completed fiscal year here. It sounds like kind of an orchestrator that's t that's ingesting a bunch of data and also executing a bunch of actions for the purpose of doing a better job of using every dollar that you put to work to engage a customer. Just just getting better ROI out of every dollar you're going to put to work for engaging a customer or a prospect. Is that is that a good way to think about what Braze is fundamentally? Yeah, I, I think that's uh I think that's pretty spot on. You know, we're we're trying to just do a better job, deliver better relevance to customers, help them, you know, explore the products and services on offer from each individual brand that we work with so that they can do, they can make it more a part of their lives, they can become yep 
you know, passionate advocates, they can develop habits around it. Um, you can avoid churn, you can help drive additional purchases, you can help um, cement subscriptions, you can, you know, have people, if we're in the um, health and fitness or the health and wellness area, you know, helping people adopt those habits they really want to, to learn a new language or learn a new skill or, um, you know, keep themselves healthy and be out, you know, hiking trails or riding their Peloton bike or what have you. Um, and so a lot of different places that this comes into play, but fundamentally, yeah, I think you nailed it. So let's talk about the the, the financials here. So I'm just going to give some numbers about 472 million in revenue for the year. That's up 33%. Gross margins hit just about 69%. The operating margin still negative 31%, but that's bad. That's about 10 points improved year over year. So it does look like you're getting some efficiency there. The remaining performance obligation up significantly. So I kind of think of remaining performance obligation as a backlog that's now close to 640 million. About 64% of that is current. So within the next next 12 months. So really yep. interesting stuff here. You now have, Bill, in terms of your overall customer base, you reported 2,044 customers for the fiscal year and the, and the current quarter. 202 are now generating at least 500,000, about half a million at least in terms of annual recurring revenue. So that's about, that's a little under 10% of the customer base. One of the ways I've thought about, just from an investment perspective, what has to happen in order for Braze to be a great stock for you know, members here at The Motley Fool is those big customers have to get more and more fervent about Braze. They've got to make bigger and bigger commitments to Braze. How do you think you create value like how does braze create value such that shareholders are going to see it over the next 10 years is it cultivating that bigger commitment to the braze platform is it growing the overall pie is it a combination of both how do you see it what's the growth look like yeah so there's a there's a few different dimensions of this and one of the things that i love about the braze business is just how diversified we are and how we've already proven that diversification so Braze's history is not one where we like found a, a, a nice little niche and we, uh, you know, we milked it for all it was worth. And then we, sure. as that one started to run out, we had to like jump to the next one. You know, we've really been, as I, as I mentioned earlier, working on a problem that I think is fundamental to capitalism and important for businesses of all kinds and really connected to um, some really like human truths of, you know, if you want to build a strong relationship with someone. You should try to understand them as well as you can when you meet them and use that understanding yeah. in order to have more relevant interactions with them. And that'll build a stronger relationship. Right. And so I think that we're, we're kind of in the fundamentals of business and we're trying to work on some fundamental things about human relationships, which means that I think that Braze's approach to this problem is applicable to the vast majority of businesses in the world. And so when you look at our customer base, we have, you know, mid 40s percent of our revenue comes from outside of the United States. It's a pretty mm -hmm. high number for a company of our age. And it's actually been relatively true through most of our history because mobile has been such a, a broadly deployed technology. We also have no meaningful diverse or no meaningful concentration in any given vertical. You know, our mm -hmm. top five or six verticals are all kind of in the high teens or low 20s percent of overall revenue. We've got another, you know, half a dozen verticals that are meaningful and up and coming. Uh, and Braze has really shown an ability to solve use cases across businesses of, you know, all kinds across the entire consumer experience. We also successfully sell the same piece of technology to the world's largest global multinationals, all, and I mentioned, you know, one of the that we had our first eight figure customer in this most recent earnings. And so, you know, we're talking about that, $10 yeah. million dollar plus ARR customer um, with one of the world's largest conglomerates, all the way down to one person teams that are at, you know, young, like, you know, e com Shopify startups or newly launching mobile apps or what have you, um, where we have a, a one person marketing team that's successfully using Braze in order to, to drive their launch. And so I think you look at that, you've got tremendous diversity of use cases. You have a platform that's proven an ability to sell across a, a wide array of verticals. They've got a, a massive global footprint and one that continues to grow. You know, we just announced that uh, we've expanded with new uh, hiring of new go-to-market people in both Korea and into Latin America as well um, as we continue to build on our international success. And, and you also have a technology platform that is enterprise ready, 
but not in the the negative sense of that word in the sense that it's like you know heavyweight and clunky and can only be used by enterprises um it's actually something that can be utilized by the world's you know largest and most complicated multinationals and is also you know very you know well wielded by uh, these small but mighty marketing teams that that often are you know can only be one person and so i think that when you look at our growth potential it's important to realize that we've actually proven an ability to sell into a substantially larger market opportunity than we are currently penetrated. You know, when you consider the the potential number of customers we have across those three dimensions, and then you take a step back and you say, wait a minute, that company only has 2000 customers today. Obviously there's a huge amount um, of future customer growth that we'll continue to sell into. The other side of it is the continued expansion of the product surface area over time. And so mm -hmm. when we first started out, you know, we were focused in mobile, we sold a product um, that had the different mobile channels as well as email. And that was the kind of starting set in 2011. Uh, and that was mobile push notifications as well as some of the end product stuff that we've been talking about. Over time, we've expanded to you know include other channels. We added web push and we, we ported our uh, in mobile app uh, products all the way into websites as well. We've then since expanded those in connected fitness products and connected TVs. Uh, we've also expanded our uh, messaging options from email to include SMS. More recently, we launched on WhatsApp. We're working on uh, Line right now as well, and we'll continue to move through the premium messenger market throughout the rest of the world. We look ahead to additional RCS adoption and, and certainly anticipate um, that we'll be expanding our SMS product to SMS and MMS product to include that in the future in product. Uh, you're seeing a continued expansion there. As our content cards becomes more flexible and powerful, we continued building on top of surveys. We also launched feature flags last fall, which is a product primarily used by product and engineering groups in order to drive additional experimentation or to be able to do um, you know, various things at release time uh, to modify the product experience as a customer is using it. And so you're seeing an expansion of the, the messaging channels that we're interacting with as well, all of which provide not just an ability for us to kind of upsell existing customers, because of course, they're going to want to adopt these new channels as they become available. But they're actually also really great starting points for new customers. So Braze actually has a lot of customers that don't have mobile apps at all, because we have channel sets that are highly relevant. And if you go back to your uh, kind of synthesis of everything that Braze does, you know, ultimately being an orchestration platform that helps with personalization and relevance, and then can can do that across whichever channel set makes sense means that you know we are able to uh, sell to and work with companies that have uh, a wide array of different digital touch points for their customers and that's been an important part of us being able to expand and do additional verticals as well so you know when we when we look at that you kind of said a few things it was like hey do we need to grow existing customers it's like yes and we we do and we will um you know both because we are not fully penetrated in our full product surface area across the vast majority of our existing customers but also even in those customers that have been with us a long time and have um, been you know using us to our fullest and ibotta is a great example of that that you brought up um that we continue adding new channels every year as well that they can continue to adopt and grow into as well as additional orchestration capabilities um, i haven't even touched on our interconnections to the data science ecosystem that we've been building um, and working on quite a bit over the last couple of years. And, and so, you know, a lot of, a lot of growth opportunity as well as a lot of great new starting points. And I think that when you look at uh, the, you know, that kind of growth path for Braze and say like, Hey, what makes this a, a great stock? What makes this an opportunity that, you know, I believe we're still very much in the early innings of, I think you look no further than just how diversified the business is already today. And then that, that 2000 customer number and imagine how, how big that gets. Yeah, I mean, that, that's interesting. Let's end on this, because I want you to, to dream a little bit and, and maybe cast the vision, help us understand the vision that you have. You've introduced Sage AI, so now you have yep. AI cooked in the product. And I think what was interesting is you said, particularly in this past earnings call, that you had integrated GPT as far back as December 2002 and then Dolly you know, a few months after that. So before there was a big hype cycle around around AI. I, I would I would love to know what you think, you know, when you cast your vision ten years out, like what what do you dream about as as Braze being able to to enable here? Because your your forecast upcoming for this current fiscal year is for about 21, 22% revenue growth at the midpoint. So that's a slowdown of where you were. That's fine if that's going to be the growth that we see over 
a long period of time. And it sounds like you think that's possible. But if you're dreaming about what Braves becomes, what does it become? So I always go back to, as I mentioned, I think our foundations are baked into capitalism and humanity. Yep. And so when I look at, you know, what even our most ambitious customers and our most sophisticated customers are um, achieving today, I still think that there's a lot of, lot of room for improvement. And what I want to see more and more brands around the world really accomplishing is that as you become a new, as you become a new kind of prospective customer um, of their products and services, that you can be welcome into that ecosystem in a way that's relevant, that's personalized, that's valuable to you, that through having valuable first interactions that are smooth, that are, um, you know, that are, are kind of coherent, that are, are harmonious with how you want to interact with that brand, that it helps cement your loyalty to it over time, that you can turn that into a habit in a good way because you found a way for it to become a part of your life in a way that is additive to it. And that as you know, mobile technology in particular, but as in general, um, we just continue to digitize more and more of uh, more and more of, of the parts of our life and the ways that we get done and that we move through the world and that we form relationships with each other and that we have great experiences, um, that that's delivered to us in a way that's on our terms, that's highly relevant and that's valuable. And so, you know, we keep going back to that mission and, and I have strong conviction that if that mission is achieved by more and more brands, that praise will be highly successful because that's exactly how you build strong first party relationships with customers. And it's how you build strong, sustaining businesses that are able to kind of invest in their own business models. When you build strength in your customer relationships and you have that in the foundation of your business, your optionality as a business to be able to innovate and move into new lines of business and be able to um, you know, innovate your products and services and continue to move forward becomes you know, multiplied tremendously because you do it on the foundation of these strong relationships. And I think that, you know, that leads to a more versatile and, and interesting economy. And I'm, I'm really excited about helping build that future. I mean, so in a world where customers are happier and feel like they're understood, Braze wins. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so do the brands, right? They get to... Yeah. They get to build businesses with substantially higher levels of efficiency. They get to build future optionality because they're not, you know, just kind of focused on the, the short-term revenue. They're, they're building strong relationships with people that are an enduring asset for their business. Uh, and that, that asset for their business helps them, you know, be more flexible into the future, take more risks, be more creative, be more innovative, become more global. Um, you know, all these great things that we like to see in, in versatile markets. Is there, so... I said I was going to end on that. I have one, one last one, a super quick one. Is there anything that gets in the way of that? Like, is there a thing that you, you think about, and you're like, this is the one thing that cannot happen in order for that, so that gets in the way of that dream being realized? I think it's just execution on our part. You know, yeah. I, when I go back to just how fundamental I think this, this is as a business problem, when, you know, our strategy is really tied to these permanent truths about humans and relationships. Um, you know, obviously, it's going to be on us to make sure that as technology continues to evolve, and, and that's whether that's consumer technology and the behaviors um, of the, the people that we're trying to communicate with and build relationships with, or it's like back end technology, it's AI capabilities, it's like, you know, do we go from the mobile phone in our pocket to it implanted in our eyeball or what have you, right? These are <laughs> form factor evolutions, like, it's going to be on braze to make sure that we stay on top of that. Um, yeah. But I, I think that, you know, we are in the right position with the right perspective over, you know, the entirety of the, the customer life cycle, being there, living in the moment, in the flow, in the context of their, um, of their journey as it evolves and being able to really work on these kind of fundamental aspects of the customer relationship. Um, that when I take a step back and say, you know, what, what are the risks? They're all about execution on our side. I think that um, the opportunity is there. I have strong confidence that we're going to be able to navigate upcoming uh, waves and changes in technology. Uh, and, and it's really just about making sure that this really ambitious vision that we've taken on where we're trying to build a global company, sell to a wide array of customers across a wide array of um, use cases and, and a diverse uh, set of verticals, you know, that's a tall order. And so we're going to keep on grinding away and executing on it. And, uh, and I think that very much our destiny is in our hands. Yeah, back to first principles, what you started with, which is which is Absolutely. interesting. Um, 
Bill, thanks so much. Really appreciate you being on Motley Fool Live today. Um, and I, we, we're we following the company. And I'll just for, for full disclosure for Fools, uh, we are a customer of Braze. And there are a lot of fans here internally of, of the product. So um, when you get emails from the Motley Fool, you are in part getting them orchestrated by Braze. So Absolutely. there you go. There um, we go. Thank you so much, Bill. We we really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you again soon here. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me this morning.